yellow. Hey, hon, do you remember how to get to the rocket launcher? Uh, oh, yeah, you got to go up the elevator and then sprint off of it at the plasma rifle. Okay, let me try that. Oh, yeah, that worked. Thanks. In the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a running gag about being online and missing phone calls. Almost everyone was on dial-up at the time, at least everyone who was online at all, and dial-up worked over ordinary phone lines. Now, you can't receive a call if you're already on a call, so if you were dialed up, you were incommunicado as far as the rest of the world was concerned. Now, broadband eliminated that problem, but most people didn't have that until the mid-2000s. So for the first decade or so, at least, of the greater online experience, what I'm doing right now, playing a video game while talking on the phone, would have been impossible. But I'm doing it. This is the real thing. There's no tricks. And in this video, I'm going to explain how this was possible. This was a running gag throughout the whole reign of dial-up internet. Missing calls because you're dialed up. And it never got fixed. The problem was forgotten when broadband swept through since it replaced virtually all dial-up service by the early 2010s, at least where I live, but some people are still using it, even here, and they still have this problem. If a proper solution is even possible, the industry gave up trying to find it a long time ago. But there were some attempts at mitigation, solutions that were actually developed and sold in the early to mid-90s. Wacky ones, of course, solutions that utterly failed and that didn't even properly solve the problem, but they did exist. I have them, and they work for values of work. I've just shown you one, uh, and I'll explain how it works to the best of my ability, but it won't make much sense unless we address what the problem actually was. So first, let's clarify what I said in the intro, because it's not quite right. If you're on the phone and someone else calls you, you can answer, as long as you have call waiting. If you haven't dealt much with actual phones, uh, you might not have ever experienced call waiting. So here's the cliff notes on that. Suppose that you're on a call and someone else dials you. If you have call waiting service, you'll hear a beeping noise over your call. You then perform a hook flash, wherein you tap the phone hook briefly, and that puts your first call on hold and pops you over to the second one. Then you can hook flash again to switch back and forth, or if you have an additional service, you can actually join the two calls together. Uh, this was first sold in the 70s, so certainly by the time dial-up started becoming popular in the mid-90s, it had been a solved problem for a long time, but only for humans. Computers couldn't play. Dial-up modems worked by placing ordinary phone calls. That's what made them dial-up. They picked up your phone line, just like you did, dialed a number, just like you did, and then they sent data back and forth by making the same kind of noises that you made with your mouth, that made other humans understand that you wanted a pizza or were mad at them. They just made those noises really, really fast to encode high-speed digital data, but they're still basically the same sounds. So if a modem was using your phone line, it was filling it up with noises, and there was nowhere to put any noises of your own. So problem one, to accept call waiting, you needed to hear the beep, and you can't hear it if your modem's using the phone line. In fact, call waiting beeps interfere with modem signals. If someone does try to call you while you're online, it'll corrupt your data. So people had to take steps to disable call waiting before they dialed up. But more importantly, to switch to an incoming call, you'd need a way to politely put your modem on hold, which for the most part wasn't possible. See, putting a call on hold doesn't really do anything. It just disconnects your mic and speaker. As far as the other end knows, you just aren't saying anything. There's no way to know that you're on hold. That's pretty much why hold music was invented, so people calling businesses wouldn't have to wonder if their call had dropped. That used to be a much more common occurrence, so it made sense if you suddenly heard nothing on your phone call to think that you weren't actually connected anymore. Modems were designed to make this same assumption, but while there's hold music for humans, there's nothing like that for PCs. When two modems are talking, they both assume they control the whole phone line and that they'll be in control for the entire duration of the connection. So they continuously send a waveform called a carrier. That's the screaming noise that you hear if you pick up the phone while your PC is dialed up. This. Modems expect to hear each other's carrier constantly, even if no data is being transmitted. If they stop hearing carrier, they assume the call dropped and they disconnect from the line. So even if you somehow accepted call waiting, as soon as you picked up, your modem would lose carrier and hang up. 
Now, technically, this could have been approved upon. Uh, phone lines don't have much in the way of special signaling, but they do have one feature called CPC that allows the phone company to tell devices like fax machines that the far end has hung up the call. Modems could have used that to distinguish between hold and disconnect. Why it was never implemented, I don't know. The fact is, it wasn't. So that's the problem. A modem call is a phone call that you can't put on hold. And that problem, as stated, was eventually solved just not in 1994. Here's what they finally did to fix it. Modems all use standards, formalized by a standards body called ITU, and they have names like uh, V.34 and V.90. And then in the year 2000, uh, the last modem standard that ever came out was called V.92. This had a feature called modem on hold, Imagine that. Uh, these modems could recognize a call waiting beep, notify the user on their PC that a call was coming in, and let them put the data connection on hold safely while you had a conversation. This worked by adding a special message that your modem could send to your internet service provider to ask them to pause the connection. When you were done with your call, you had your modem send that message again, and your data connection resumed. Had this feature come out five or six years earlier, the classic joke might not have ever made it to most people's ears because prior to the mid 90s, the overwhelming majority of people, even computer owners, never used a modem in any capacity. The internet explosion is what made them topical, but by the time this feature finally came out, that explosion had become a norm and it was really too late for this to do much good. For one thing, V.92 was an extension to V.90, and that was the standard that gave us 56K. Now, people often use 56K as a synonym for dial-up in general, but it was far from universal. A lot of people never got it. It didn't even exist until 1998, at which point tons of people had the older V.34 modems. So to get the new higher speeds, you had to upgrade your gear, plus you had to have a phone line in good enough condition for it to work, which a lot of people didn't. And finally, your ISP had to support it. And although many of them did eventually upgrade to V.90 service, they would have had to upgrade their equipment again for V.92, and that was kind of absurd. When this new standard came out, most ISPs had only just upgraded to 56K, at most two years earlier. So a bunch of ISPs literally said, no, we aren't upgrading to V.92. It's a huge expense with no return. And that makes sense. It was standardized in 2000, but it wasn't really being deployed until 2001, at which point people were already getting DSL and cable. Dial-up was clearly on the way out, not up. So it didn't make any sense to spend more money on the infrastructure. So V.92 was just too little too late, but for other reasons as well. Consider that in 1994, online computing was very transactional. People often dialed up, spent just a few minutes online to get new emails or a BBS update or whatever, and then they disconnected to digest their new data. But by 2000, when standards like this came out, people were often spending hours online. So if you were stuck on dial-up, the joke still would have been relevant. Mom wants to talk to her sister, but the kid is whining about being cut off from his IRC, that sort of thing. And that frustration would have applied to a lot of situations. If you wanted to call a coworker and send them files while discussing your work, or call someone up to play Doom while trash talking them out loud, it was all just plain impossible. And V.92 didn't help. You didn't want to put your modem on hold, you wanted to use it while talking. And the only options were to either wait for cable or DSL or get a second phone line. There was nothing else. But this being the 90s, the fact that something was infeasible never stopped anyone. In the grand tradition of the era, multiple technologies were released that purported to let you call another person's PC and talk to them simultaneously. And they weren't bullshit. You saw me demonstrating one at the beginning of this video. That wasn't movie magic. I really was talking on the phone and playing Doom with my girlfriend simultaneously over a single phone line. Nothing up my sleeve, I don't even have sleeves. It really works. And before you rush off and assume that you know how this is accomplished, I'm gonna say up front, the trick is not voice over IP. That's the boring solution that we eventually came up with, and let's talk about why that too would not have been a useful suggestion in 1994. Voice over IP, or VoIP, comes in many forms. Some of us use Cisco or Yealink or Polycom phones at our jobs, for instance, and those are VoIP-based devices, but there are tons of consumer products. Discord voice, FaceTime, Zoom, in-game chat in your FPS of choice. Anything that lets you hear someone's voice over the internet is voice over IP. And in fact, a lot of the things I just mentioned use the same protocols under the hood, but I digress. These things let us talk to each other on our PCs while doing many other things, and they work very well. 
And some of the tech for doing it did exist in the mid 90s, but there are a dozen reasons it wouldn't have worked for this application. Let's cherry pick some. VoIP requires your PC to convert audio into digitized samples. That required gobs of CPU power by the standards of the time. It's virtually free now, but in 1994, that one task could occupy most of a Pentium, which most people didn't even have. In fact, most computers didn't even have sound cards. Dial-up also had severely limited bandwidth. An uncompressed phone call takes up about 64 kilobits per second, which is faster than even the fastest dial-up modems. You could brutally compress it, but that would probably kill the quality and require an expensive hardware coprocessor. And the problems get worse. Uh, not everyone was using their modems to reach the internet in 94. It was one option, but people also did a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connections, that is, calling each other directly. That never involved IP at all. It could have, but it didn't. See, we're used to the idea that when you connect two computers, you use a networking technology. Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, every generic way of connecting two PCs is also meant to let hundreds of systems communicate on a mass scale. They're very organized protocols with intrinsic support for mixing different types of data in the same pipe. Lots of programs put data in at one end, and when it comes out the other, your operating system knows how to break each morsel of information apart and give it to the program that wants it. But peer-to-peer dial-up almost never worked that way. I demonstrated in my video on the 300 baud modems that used to dominate the dial-up world that all a modem does is simulate a very long, very crappy serial cable. That is literally true, and you can take it to the bank. Now, serial has no packet protocol. There's no framing built in. A serial port is, in no uncertain terms, a hole into which you can throw bytes, and they come out somewhere else. That's it. Once two computers are dialed up to each other, all they can do is throw bytes back and forth. There are no ports, no protocols, just bytes. If you dialed up to the internet, that added an IP layer to the mix, and you got uh, the ports and the protocols, etc. But if you dialed up to another person, your PCs almost always just spoke raw bytes to one another, in whatever protocol your chosen application used. If you called someone up to play Doom, then Doom was in charge of the modem. It controlled the serial port, and it saturated your connection with constant updates about what was going on in the game. There was no bandwidth left over for any other data, and even if there was, it was impossible for another program to shove something into the byte stream or to strip the data back out at the other end. It would have just been received by the other copy of the game and confused it until it crashed. And even that's moot, really, because if you are running Doom, well, that runs under DOS, where there's no multitasking. The game owns the whole machine as long as it's running. There's just nowhere to put a voice over IP program. And even if you ran Doom inside a DOS box under Windows, the game still had total control of the serial port. It just wasn't doable. Doom 95 was probably a different story. I think it supported IP, or at least IPX, but it didn't come out until 1996. And even afterwards, there were other popular DOS-based multiplayer games with the same limitations. But I think I've made my point. VoIP was not and could not be the solution, QED. So having finally finished the prologue, let's see what they actually did try. Between like uh, 94 and 96, several different technologies arose under the umbrella of simultaneous voice and data. Now, I have three sets of modems here that offer that. I'm pretty sure their uptake was almost nothing. And that's a shame because a lot of work was put into this stuff, uh, and not just from one company. They all use completely different approaches to the problem. Uh, in fact, the first method is so wildly different from the others that it's almost a lie. This US Robotics Acura 288 looks pretty much like any name brand modem sold in the mid 90s. It's got a big gaudy box, kind of like a forerunner of those GPUs with the big shiny fantasy ladies on the front. It offers tons of promises, tons of bundled software. It's a desperate attempt to make you grab this off the shelf at Circuit City instead of one of the off-brand modems, which were the exact same hardware. This is something I've learned. Modems from the 80s might have had some engineering going on inside, but by the 90s, almost every single one was identical. I've looked at hundreds of modems, and nearly all of them had the same IC from the same company, Rockwell Semiconductor. They all have the same list of capabilities, plus or minus three voice or fax features that almost nobody cared about, but they're otherwise the same. All right, let's bring in the modems. These are all of the in-box modems I currently own, and if you look at the back, uh, or the side of any one of them, you'll see one of these gigantic lists of supported standards. And it looks very impressive, but they're 
just copied and pasted from the data sheet from the chip. And it's the same chip that's in every one of these. We open this up. Okay, ironically, this one actually ended up being a Cirrus Logic. It's one of the one of the few other brands you ever saw. I've embarrassed myself. Hang on, let me find a Rockwell. I made a mockery of my own video. Actually, that might that might be a win modem. That might not even be the real thing. Here, let's try this one. <laughs> right, right. That's in the computer right now, I think. There we go. You open up virtually any modem from the entire decade, and what do you find? This exact same Rockwell logo on a chip that has almost the exact same specs, uh, plus or minus a fax feature. Uh, and you can be sure that none of these manufacturers, assuming any of these companies actually made these boards, bothered to test even a fraction of those modes. Some of them might not even work. We'll come back to that. This has the same sea of mostly useless information on it, but here on the front in the corner is the logo for the thing we're interested in. This is called VoiceView Talk Shop. It's a proprietary technology uh, from a company with a pleasant name, Radish Communications. And what's most interesting is that it's not what I said it is. It hit the market at the same time as the other simultaneous voice and data products, and it was often described with that term in magazines and stuff, but it literally cannot do that thing. It's more of a refinement of an existing feature that all modems could do. So let's look at the normal modem dial-up process. We're gonna make a quick modem call. Uh, I have a phone line simulator set up here from Teltone. Uh, this is a, like a little virtual phone company. It makes fake dial tone, uh, and my two ordinary PC modems can dial to each other at convenient single digit phone numbers. Uh, this one is at two, and this one is at one. <laughs> For my software, uh, I'm going to use HyperTerminal because it gives me total control over what's being sent to and from the modem. There won't be any hidden data being sent here. So to start, I'm just going to ask one to dial the other. ATDT2 means dial the number two followed by a pound, and the T means use touch tones. Otherwise, it might use pulse dialing. So it picks up, dials, and this end is going to show the word ring and I type ATA to answer. We pick up. There we go. Handshaking. And we're connected. Uh, and the two ends tell us what speeds they connected to the computer at, not actually what speeds they connected to each other at. So this one says 28,800, this one says 38,400. Those aren't actually the speeds of the connection, but these are both capable of 33.6, uh, and the light on this one that says V34 is lit, which means that they did connect at 33.6 kilobits. Now that's still pretty slow um, as serial ports go, so I have a very slow serial cable connected between these two machines now. Since I'm using a terminal app, however, absolutely nothing will be sent over that cable except what I type. So if I do some key smashing here, it all appears on this machine and vice versa over there. But when I stop, there's nothing being transmitted. Literally, the serial ports on these two modems are completely idle. And yet, if I pick up the phone, even though nothing's going on, there's still this awful screeching noise, the ever-present data carrier. Now, to be fair, you could have a conversation over this if you but it wouldn't be very fun. Uh, and if you do it long enough, uh, the modems will decide the carrier is too degraded and hang up. <laughs> it's always funny, every time. <laughs> Yelling. Yelling is funny. All right, what's the next uh, paragraph look like? So suppose it's 1994, and I want to send you a one megabyte file. The internet barely exists at this point. There are no file sharing sites. So maybe I could email it, but I'd have to trust that both our providers will allow an attachment that big, and I won't hold my breath on that. Plus, I'd have to be okay with them having the file, which might not be okay if it's sensitive data. What I can do is just dial straight into your PC and send the file right over using something like a terminal app and Z modem. But let's say that we aren't terribly savvy users, like a couple of business dudes that barely know what they're doing. That process could be a hot mess. It might look like this. I dial your number. 
you don't know I'm trying to send you a file, so you pick up the phone. I tell you, hey, I wanna send you a file. So you hang up the phone, and then you sit there waiting for the line to ring again. When it does, you have to yell at everyone else in your house, don't pick up the phone. Eventually, your PC answers the call. Now, you have to start up your file transfer program, and I have to start it from my end, but only once you have it open on yours. And if one of us gets that sequence wrong, then the transfer never starts, and we don't know why. All we can do is wait and wait, and eventually go, okay, I guess it didn't work, and hang up. And then you have to call me to find out what happened. And you have to wait a minute first to make sure that my modem is hung up on my end or you'll get a busy signal. And if my PC tries to dial you as you're dialing me, then we'll both get busy signals, a condition the phone company calls glare. And if I think that you're trying to call me with your modem to try the connection again, then I might just let the PC answer instead of picking up and so on and so on. It could be 10 minutes before we get connected again, maybe longer. By the way, if you've Never thought about life before cell phones, and this sounds like an unendurable nightmare. Trust me, everything was like this. I was there for a bit. Existence was pain. Suffering was life. This sort of silly shenanigan could be expected in situations not even involving computers. Phone tag was awful. People used to buy three gallons of milk by accident because you couldn't just call your girlfriend and ask, hey honey, should I get milk? Are you getting milk? Are we even out of milk? This stuff was just par for the course. But anyway, assuming none of that crap happened and everything went well, once you have my file, one of us has to call the other so we can discuss what I sent. And then as we're talking, maybe you have some data you want to send back, maybe just a few kilobytes worth. Well, now we have to hang up and do the whole dance all over again, wasting possibly 10 more minutes fighting to get connected to send a quantity of data that even a 33.6 modem will transmit in a couple seconds. This is obviously absurd, particularly because we're ending and restarting the same phone call over and over. Why not just make one call and use it for both purposes? Well, you could. I'm giving you the worst case scenario where we aren't modem experts, like probably most people weren't. If we're both savvy, we can make this a lot smoother. See, modems, since time immemorial, don't care whether they do the dialing or you do. In fact, uh, self-dialing modems were fairly exotic. Uh, this guy here uh, was one of the first that could actually do it and most people didn't have them. Uh, so throughout the 80s in particular, you had to dial for your modem unless you were a real enthusiast. Now, the original dial-up process looked like this. Suppose we wanted to send some data in the early 80s. Here's how it would work. I pick up my phone, and I call you. You answer, like normal, and I tell you that I want to send a file. Now, we both just turn on our modems. And they instantly begin screaming at one another, and we have a connection, just like that. If I type over here, crap appears there, and if I type here, crap appears there. And now I can just send a file at a whole 300 bits per second because that's how fast these modems are and how fast most modems were in the 80s. But once we're done, we just switch off our modems and we're back on the phone. The modems drop their carrier signal, the line is clear, and we can start talking again without making a new call. Now these are very old, very slow modems, but when we got into the uh, smart modems uh, of the late 80s and 90s, the ones that could uh, do their own dialing and could communicate at much higher speeds, this trick was still possible. It was just a little more involved to set it up. So here's what we could do. We enter the command ATX0, which tells my modem not to care whether there's dial tone or not when it picks up the line. Then I just uh, call you. And you pick up on your ordinary telephone. I tell you that I want to send a file. And then I say ATDT2, and then immediately pick up over here. And now we're connected. And uh, if I type some junk over here, it shows up over there, and vice versa. So I can send you a file like this, and then when the file transfer is done, we both pick our phones up again, and we send a command that tells the modem to hang up. And now we can talk on the phone again using the exact same phone call. So this obviously streamlines things, but there are still a few problems. You do need to be savvy uh, to do this, particularly with the smart modems that were commonplace by the 90s. The ones like this that can dial on their own need to be told that you're doing this. They need to be told not to try to dial a new call. That's why I had to enter ATX0. 
And you had to know how to configure every program you used to do that. And some programs didn't make it easy. Also, you can't leave the phone off hook while your file transfer is going on. I mean, for one, you'll be listening to deafening screeching noises the whole time. But also, if you make any sounds loud enough for the phone to pick them up, you'll corrupt the file transfer. So you have to initiate the modem connection, hang up your phone, wait for the file transfer to finish, but then you have to pick up again before your modems disconnect. Because if neither the phone or the modem are off hook, then your call will disconnect and you'll have to call each other back again anyway. This is like a proof of concept showing that the phone line can be used for mixed voice and data, but it's not a very smooth process. Voice View, on the other hand, took this sequence of events and made it smoother. And I'd love to demo it for you, but yeah, sorry, I lied. Uh, I actually don't have a pair of Voice View modems, just the one. But not for lack of trying, okay? I tried. I've been searching for years, and this is the only one I've ever found. These things must have been made in incredibly small quantities. I've struggled to even find model numbers of devices that support it. I actually found a couple modems at 3PC recently that say they support Voice View on the box. Let's see, right? Uh, no, it's on the back. There we go. Voice view for verbal communication and data transfers during same connection. But I tested them and they don't seem to work. The features enabled in the chip, it responds to the commands correctly, but there's just no sound. Uh, so I think they didn't wire it up correctly. Again, I, I think the manufacturers don't really know how these chips work. They just write whatever's on the data sheet and don't understand that they need to be wired up differently for different applications. So I've given up and I'm just gonna have to talk you through how this works. But fortunately, it's really straightforward. It's just like the process I just showed you with conventional modems, it's just nicer. I call you, you pick up, we talk, we then tell our modems to go to data mode. They do a handshake like a normal modem call, but once they know there's a good connection, they both drop their carrier signal. They're still connected, they're still listening to what's on the line, but they aren't producing any sound. So we can just keep talking. But if either one of us drags and drops a file onto the special voice view app, it sends a command to the modem to tell it to turn its data carrier back on. The modem starts streaming into the line, and then when the other person's modem hears that screaming, it turns its own data carrier back on. The two then very quickly renegotiate just to make sure the connection is still good, and they start the file transfer. Once it finishes, both modems drop carrier again, and we can go right back to talking. So like I said, this is just a refinement of what you could do already, but it is a substantial refinement. It makes the process of switching voice to data and back automatic and safe. You don't have to do the silly rigmarole with snatching the phone off the hook just in time for the connection to end because the modem offers its own voice switching feature. See, every modem has two jacks on the back. One plugs into the wall and one allows you to hook up a normal telephone set. This isn't required for the modem to work, it's just a convenience feature. It's so you don't have to put in a whole second phone jack just to have your modem and a normal phone at the same desk. You could also use a plain old jack splitter if you wanted. That's essentially what these ports are inside, just the pins are wired straight together. But voice view modems, on the other hand, add a relay that disconnects the pass-through port when you're in data mode. So as long as you're using a handset that's plugged in through the modem, you can leave your speakerphone on if you want and you won't have to put up with loud screeching and you won't need to mute your mic to avoid data corruption. Also, since the modems hold the line open for you, you don't need to pick up as soon as the connection's over. Your friend can wait a couple minutes while you're in the kitchen getting a drink and the call will still be there when you come back and pick up again. And finally, it's just much faster. According to what I've read, going from voice to data mode and back just takes like a few dozen milliseconds. So if you're sending a bunch of little files back and forth, like you're making tiny changes to a Word document and sending those and then discussing those and then doing it again, sending a, a new copy back, you don't wanna go through a whole 45 second dial and handshake process every single time. This solution gets it down to something tolerable. So is it actually simultaneous voice and data? No, it's more like pulse width modulated voice and data. Averaged over time, it's simultaneous, but at any given moment, it's one or the other. And that's pretty disappointing. It doesn't really solve the core complaint. And it's hamstrung by the fact that most software would not have worked well with this trick. This modem came with a special program that knows how to tell it to turn the data signal on and off, but I believe that it could automatically switch between modes, even if you're using a program that doesn't know anything about the technology. The modem can just detect if data is being sent to it, 
And if so, it brings up carrier. And then if nothing's transmitted for a while, it just shuts the carrier back off automatically. It's not as slick, but it would be very compatible. The problem is a lot of sophisticated software probably sent traffic almost continuously, at least the occasional keep alive byte, even if you weren't really doing anything. And that would cause the modem to periodically interrupt your conversation. Something like net meeting or a video game, on the other hand, would be sending data continuously. There'd be no opportunity to go to voice mode at all. So in summary, voice view is a clever feature, but it's really one that they should have added to modems in the mid eighties, cause it's really simple to implement and it would have been a slight improvement to all modems if it was universal. But by the time these people introduced it in 1984, it was kind of too late for it to do any good. I think that voice view was the least popular of the technologies though. References to it popped up in various OEM modem manuals for a couple years, but like I said, it's incredibly hard to actually find one. I mean, all the stuff I'm talking about here is rare, but I at least was able to get more than one specimen of the other technologies. Since I did though, let's take a look at one that actually works. In 1996, the ITU ratified the V.61 standard for a simultaneous voice and data modem, those exact words. And this was the real McCoy. The standard was based on technology from an organization called Paradigm, which unsurprisingly had previously been AT&T's research division. And their trademark for it was audio span, which continued to be used occasionally in marketing but it was also often referred to simply as SVD. Now I have two audio span capable modems here uh, with a really twee name. It's called the Microcom Office Porte Voice. Now I should point out uh, first off that they're really, really small. Uh, before I started collecting modems, almost everyone I'd ever seen was a US Robotics of the 90s styling, like this one, uh, or the older industrial style of the 80s. And uh, these are both pretty chunky monkeys, but this guy, is just tiny. In fact, it's so small that it actually eschews the uh, typical DB25 connector. It's on the back of most modems and goes with a plain DE9, uh, like what you'd see on the back of most PCs. There's nothing wrong with this per se, uh, but it is kind of irritating. I've never seen it on any other modem and due to the gender of this connector, it can actually be kind of irritating trying to find a compatible cable. But anyway, in addition to the serial port, the power jack, and the usual phone jacks, on the side, we have a headphone and mic jack. Now you might think, wow, a headset interface, I guess that's how you can tell it's an SVD modem, right? Well, not quite, actually. One of the big features that was pushed by modem vendors starting in like the mid 80s was the ability to use your modem to place normal phone calls. Some 80s phones had the ability to do speed dials, but only, you know, eight or 10 or maybe 20. A piece of software, on the other hand, could store thousands of phone numbers. Now, modems, like I said, didn't use to be able to dial on their own, but once they gained that ability, then they could automate dialing from an address book like that. And that was convenient for a lot of professionals who were on the phone all day. And you could use a normal phone, but since using a headset was more comfortable and it saved space on your desk, by the 90s, a lot of modems started adding mic and speaker jacks, and you could configure those to dial a number and then just cut the audio straight through to the headset. They weren't on most modems, certainly. Uh, the prototypical US robotics that I have here doesn't have them, but I have several that do. I just lost them, apparently. I was gonna use them as a prop, but I don't know where the hell I put them. And this one is actually very typical for the most part. If you hook this up to a Windows 95 machine, it'll identify it as a standard 33.6 modem and it'll make and receive data calls like normal with no special behavior. To make it do anything unique, you have to send it special commands to enable the SVD features. Now, Something I'll tell you about modem manufacturers, uh, they were all really lazy. So the manuals for all these SVD modems, they look okay at first. Like this is for the office porte. You open this up, you start flipping through it. Hey, you know, it looks, looks pretty complete. Looks like they covered a lot of stuff here. But in reality, good portions of this are just chunks of text copied out of the data sheet. None of this is stuff uh, that this company actually wrote. They just got this directly from uh, Rockwell and just dumped it straight into the book. And in some cases, these don't actually cover all the features the modem has. In some cases, they don't even make sense, but <laughs> this manual barely mentions the SVD function at all. There's a bullet point in the feature list and a couple entries in the command reference, but there's no instructions on how to actually use those. Instead, they included this, the uh, Office Porte modem addendum, uh, which addresses audio span, analog, simultaneous voice and data. 
but it's mostly just the same information that's in the book. They just copied it and printed it all out again, but it does include one command, fortunately, you can drop into a program that'll enable voice support, and it's this one right here. So let's see what that looks like. We're in hyperterminal again, and I have to type in some line noise to enable voice mode. It's gonna be a bit more complex than what was in the booklet. I'll explain why that is later. Uh, the command is at-sms equals two, 4800, 4800. And then the next command is at pound VLS equals six. So if you're playing along at home, you can use these commands as well, assuming your modem is anything like mine. All right, uh, now we just dial. Ring. Answer. And we're connected. Uh, if I smash some keys here, they show up there. And if I smash some keys here, they show up there. Uh, so we have a data connection, but now let's flip over to the speaker jack. All right, now in order for you to hear me, I have to pick up this modem and talk into the front. And that's pretty silly, uh, but it turns out uh, the mic jack on the side here behaves really strangely. I've tried five different mics and they all just like fade in and out. They make weird popping noises. It's completely unintelligible, so I've had to resort to this. Uh, each modem has a built-in speakerphone, and although it isn't a very good one, uh, that does mean that they have built-in mics as well. You can see right there. Uh, the mics aren't very good either. If I move more than a couple inches away, you'll barely be able to hear me. Uh, but it's good enough for a demo, and uh, I'm sure that when these were new, they were sold with external mics that sounded at least this good or better. Anyway, the point is, we clearly have a voice connection. So let's go ahead and start a file transfer over Zmodem. Receive. We will send doom2.wad. All right, and we're transferring at, uh, yeah, not so great a speed, unfortunately. I don't think we can really trust the speed indicator here. Uh, it just seems to bounce all over the place. And actually, it started out at like 18 or 19 kilobits but it's slowing down, slowing down, but it's most likely going to settle around 4,800 bits per second, which might have been an okay modem speed in like the late 80s. But we are at least transferring, uh, and you can still hear my voice, so we are truly getting what we were promised. We are simultaneously voicing and dataing. Uh, in fact, if I pick up the phone, uh, you can hear the modems screaming away at each other. That's what's actually happening on the phone line. Yet my voice is coming through to the other modem just fine. Actually, it's funny. I, when I wrote the script, I said, well, I'll pick up the phone line, but I forgot that it disconnects the telephone set. So I had to fully in that audio. I need to stress that there's no special software running on the computer right now. I don't even have a driver installed for these modems. I just talk to them over the serial port by hand. Uh, I've actually tested this with a pair of plain old like VT100 style serial terminals and it still worked because all the magic is in the modems. And that means that it can work with almost any program. Nothing needs to explicitly support the voice feature as long as it supports custom modem init strings, which almost everything did. For instance, uh, in the folder for Doom is a file called modem.stir uh, that contains all these uh, various strings of line noise that initialize different brands of modems. Uh, so I wrote one to support the Office Porte, this one here, it sends that same uh, chunk of gibberish that I typed in manually. Uh, and that means that I can go fire up a game and we just go down here to choose your modem. And there's the Office Porte. And then when we select modem game, and when I hit wait for call, you can see it send that line of gibberish to the modem, and now it's ready to go. So we'll just dial from this end, sends the same junk. And they're negotiating, which you can't hear, but this is what it would sound like on the line. And here we are. Uh, I'm connected, I'm in a deathmatch, and you're hearing uh, what we would hear if we were playing against each other like this in 1994, or maybe 95, I'm not 100% sure when these actually hit the market, but Doom was certainly still contemporary. And so I can run up and murder you, and you'll be able to hear me calling you a loser, weak, dumb, etc., you know, as was the style of the time. But, <laughs> well, if it isn't obvious, the game is running 
let's call it unplayably slow. Uh, the voice feature, unfortunately, cuts out a tremendous chunk of bandwidth. 4,800 bits per second is the speed this is actually connected at, and that just isn't really fast enough for this game. But it is at least technically working. The modem is doing exactly what it said it would do. We are sending files, we're gaming, and we're talking at the same time. Doom was the most data-intensive network software in existence at this time, so it's no surprise that this modem can't handle it. But if you were playing, say, Warcraft, which came out the same year, I'm sure it was plenty fast enough for that. So how does this magic work? I don't know. <laughs> the V.61 spec is really hard for me to grok. It seems to leave out chunks of information that they figured readers would already have, I guess. Or maybe it's just poorly written. I, I don't know. I discussed it with several friends who were smarter than me. I read every magazine article I could find. I read several patents, several other ITU specs to try to get a notion of how it functioned, and I still don't really get it. I hope someone who knows leaves a comment because I'll pin it. I'm not afraid to say. It. I'm baffled on this one. But here's what I think I got. Modems in this era used a technique called quadrature amplitude modulation, or QAM. CAM? I don't know, I like QAM. Basically, the data is sent on a waveform of a single frequency, and the modem at the far end pays attention only to that frequency and ignores all others. All the actual information is encoded by phase and amplitude shifts rather than frequency changes. For SVD, the modem takes that analog signal from your voice and modulates the already modulated data signal with it and then transmits the resulting mess. The receiving modem's QAM decoder perceives your voice as line noise, essentially, and ignores it while extracting the QAM data. And the voice circuitry does the reverse, removing the QAM and leaving only the audio component. So now you have your two separate signals. You split them out, uh, the data goes to the PC, and the voice goes to the headset. So while all modems work in terms of digital signals encoded as analog ones, this technique is definitely even more analog than most modem technology. In fact, contemporary sources actually deemed this ASVD, or Analog Simultaneous Voice and Data, to contrast with its primary competition, which happens to be the third technology we're discussing today. That technology was called DSVD, or Digital Simultaneous Voice and Data, and it was standardized in ITU spec V.70. It is, to my unlearned eyes, a much more sensible approach to this problem, and from all descriptions, this seems to be true. ASVD nominally tops out at 4.6K per second. That is a terrible bit rate, even for 1994. 33.6 modems were very new at the time, but 28.8 was around, and 14.4 was universal, so this was a miserable limitation to have. DSVD, on the other hand, was able to squeeze in a whole 14.4K while still passing a voice signal, so it's much more efficient. Something I didn't mention yet, actually, is that ASVD has a voice activity detection feature, wherein if you're talking, the modem is sending voice data, but if you stop talking for a bit, it can disconnect the voice channel and offer more bandwidth to the computer until you start talking again. But it apparently still couldn't do any better than 14.4, even with voice disabled, for some reason. DSVD, on the other hand, could get all the way up to line speed when nobody was talking. And that's not the only advantage. So let's see what we're working with. I have a pair of modems uh, from a company I love called Multitech. It's one of my favorite quirky network hardware companies. They're actually still around, and they're still selling things that look pretty much just like this. Now these modems are called Multimodem DSVD, and they're also really tiny. They're so small. They're actually arguably smaller than the Office Porte in a... S you know what? They're not. I mean, the Office Porte is taller, but it still just has the small nature. It's like holding a mouse. And the funny thing is, uh, despite that, they have all the same parts. These have the power jack, they've got the phone jacks, they've got the serial port, and they have the headset jacks on the side. But the multimodems are just enough bigger that they managed to use the full-size DB25, so they're a lot more convenient. I love these little modems, but they're only here to show you what a typical device might have looked like. I was supposed to demo with these, but sadly, one of them has died. They were both working when I originally wrote the script two years ago. Yes, this has been on the back burner for a while. But when I pulled them out to actually shoot the video a couple weeks ago, I found that one of them had kicked the bucket. Uh, it picks up the line, but it just gets dead air, and everything I tried to fix it failed. I couldn't bear to leave them out because they're so cute, but this almost wrecked the whole video. 
Two years ago, I was able to find a bunch of SVD modems on eBay, but they've all since dried up. I couldn't find anything when I looked. So at that point, I was down to one working technology out of three, which isn't a very good video. So I went to RePC, my local electronics store, and I found a box for this modem, which very clearly supports the feature, but only one of them. And when I tried to get it to talk to the remaining multi-modem that was still functioning, it would connect. It said SVD was working, but it couldn't establish a voice channel. So I had to spend another couple days searching until I managed to find another one on eBay from a seller who raked me over the coals to the tune of $70 for a thing that nobody alive except me cares about. So that guy can go to hell. But in the end, I wound up with the only remaining pair of DSVD modems on the planet, apparently. And they're internal ones, which sucks, but they work exactly the same as the external devices. Just the external ones look a lot prettier on camera. Even though they're internal, they work precisely the same way. They actually just show up as additional serial ports to the host machine, and you talk to them just like any other modem. The bigger difference about them, however, is that these ones don't use headset jacks. See, it was up to manufacturers on exactly how they wanted to implement SVD physically. They had the option to use a headset interface like Microcom and Multitech did, but US Robotics in this case chose a very different approach. These modems only support voice over the telephone pass-through port and in a very surprising way. Let's see that in action. So like before, I've got Hyperterminal running on here and uh, I'm gonna type some sludge in to tell the thing what to do. Uh, we go AT-SSE equals one. That's the special chunk of line noise that tells these modems that we want voice mode. And now we're just going to dial like normal. Ring and we'll answer. And now they do their little dance. And we're now connected, and it says SVD to indicate that these did establish simultaneous voice and data. So I can now bang out whatever nonsense I want. We're obviously connected. Uh, let's go ahead and send a file. So I'll set up receive over here, and we'll set up send over here. And once again, uh, Z modem is clearly lying to us because these aren't 33.6 modems, so it can't be that fast, unless I'm just doing the math wrong. But uh, these are definitely transferring at the full 28.8 kilobits per second that these modems are capable of. But that's only because voice mode isn't actually enabled right now. I told it that I might want voice, but we're actually in pure data mode at the moment. Uh, in order to talk to the other person, I have to actually pick up the phone that I have connected to the modem's pass-through port and then it rings the other end. Pick that up. And now we're connected. Most SVD modems that I've seen, uh, including the ones I've shown you on this video so far, uh, just used a headset instead of an actual telephone. And this seems kind of wacky in comparison, but it makes a lot of sense. The headset approach assumes that you want to be in communication the whole time your modems are connected. But what if you're doing a really long-running file transfer, for instance? You might not want to have an open mic the entire time. I mean, it could be hours. So instead, this creates a virtual phone line running on top of your modem call that's running on top of your real phone line. Again, uh, as with the earlier SVD modems, if we were to actually listen to the phone line itself, this is what you'd hear. So yeah, we're not actually talking over the phone line right now. We're talking inside the modem protocol. When you want to have a conversation after you connect like this and you pick up your phone, it sends a ring signal inside the SVD protocol. Uh, and just like a real phone call, the other person can answer if they want or they can ignore it if they want. And if you are talking, you can just hang it up. At any time. And then if you want to get back in touch later, you can just call back. As long as the modems are still online, anyway. In my opinion, this is a superior solution to the headset approach. And more importantly, it's a lot faster than ASVD. Let's see how this handles Doom. Once again, I've programmed the modem parameters into the game. So we just go down here and pick uh, DSVD. And then we will start a game. You can see it send the junk to tell it to turn on voice mode.
All right, we're connected and you can tell it's running better than it was over ASVD. Um, it's still a little sluggish. Wouldn't want to play Doom like this, but uh, a lot of people did back in the day and this is definitely more than playable. Uh, but let's go ahead and pick up the handset. So it rings and then my opponent picks up. Watch closely, the game actually freezes for a couple seconds as it's negotiating the voice connection and it stays frozen this time around. All right, let's try again. There we go. Is that working now? Yes, I see audio, cool. For some reason, occasionally, when you pick up the phone, it just won't connect, or it says it's connected, but there's dead air. I can't begin to guess why this is happening, but again, this is technology that never exited its first generation, so I guess we shouldn't be surprised that there's a, a, a few glitches. Uh, anyway, we are now connected over voice, obviously. Unfortunately, the game has become uh, considerably less playable. It's definitely gotten a lot slower. Um, my Z modem connection claimed we were still getting the same full 33.6K that it was never getting to begin with, but here it's pretty clear that the game's running slower than it was before. Again, this is most likely connected at effectively 14.4K, uh, but if we hang up, we can see the game jump right back to playable speeds. Uh, but that's not really what you want, you know? <laughs> you wanna be able to, uh, you know, frag your friend and then call them the things that gamers called each other back then. So this is not super ideal if you have to, um, you know, find a, a, a safe place to squat for a bit in order to pick up the phone, wait for them to pick up, insult them, and then hang up so you can play again. But it's still pretty cool that it works. And the thing is, this is why I was so sad that the multi-modem I showed you earlier died because that pair of modems could actually connect at 33.6K. So when you added the DSVD mode, it still left enough bandwidth that Doom ran playably. And I really wish I could have demoed that for you. Still, even at 28.8 or effectively 14.4, uh, there are lots of things you could do that aren't Doom that would work just fine. So this really is the genuine article. I wish you didn't have to take my word for it, but uh, I assure you, with a pair of 33.6 capable DSVD modems, you could play a demanding online video game at full speed while chatting. And that's pretty impressive, but how the hell does it work? Well, again, I don't really know. I'm sorry. I'm doing my best. I spent hours and hours reading about this, but frankly, I just can't swear that I actually get what's going on here. Once again, though, I'll give it a shot. ASVD takes a normal QAM modem signal and modulates the whole thing with an audio waveform. DSVD, on the other hand, turns your voice into a digital signal and puts it inside the QAM. But wait, you say, you told me you couldn't mix two different data streams because there's no way to separate them again. So am I lying? Well, when you dial up with a pair of modems, they go through their noisy handshake process. One sends all these mystery tones down the line, the other one listens to those to figure out what frequencies do and don't work, and it sends back its own tones, and together the two devices work out what speed they can both connect at, and then they set up a carrier. And the PC doesn't know any of that. It's just sitting there the whole time, waiting. And when the modems are finally done with their little dance, they spit back a message saying what speed they finally connected at. And the PC doesn't know how that number was reached or if it's even true. So imagine if your modem connected at 33.6, but it only told the PC that it connected at 14.4. Well, now the PC is only gonna send data at that slower speed, leaving plenty of room for the modem to pack in whatever it likes. But how exactly does it do that? Let's find out in another very special episode of Webcam Inserts with Gravis, where I explain what I got wrong and you don't hear the criminally incorrect thing I said at the studio. When I originally wrote this script, which was, again, three years ago, I was certain that my explanation of DSVD was based on the V.70 spec and that it was plausible to boot. But I can't figure out today how what I wrote in 2020 could have come from that document. In fact, now that I've looked at it again, I don't even understand why I was confused. I see exactly how it works. Basically, V.70 is VoIP. I mean, not really, not at all, but enough to be embarrassing, so let's make this quick. V.70 is based on HDLC, which won't mean anything to most of you, but HDLC has been one of the most popular ways of organizing data on a generic serial link for decades. It's the Ethernet of serial ports, if you will. 
Like I said, the best way to combine voice and data on one line would be a network protocol, which your PC in this era couldn't manage on its own. So DSVD modems basically create a little network between each other when they handshake, and they establish two separate data channels, basically network connections on two separate ports, if you will. And they send your PC's data down one and voice data down the other. It's as simple as that. They actually take advantage of the packetized nature of this link to prioritize data. You might not know that modems in this era had error correction, uh, but they did, and that can slow down connections because corrupted packets have to be retransmitted. But since dropping the occasional audio packet during a phone call isn't a big deal, these modems were able to ignore errors on the voice channel, which kept bandwidth high and latency low. So it's really a very clean solution. It still couldn't have been done without special hardware, of course, because the software on your PC can't be expected to understand this new protocol. So it's instead shown what looks like a plain old modem. It doesn't know that any data it sends gets bundled up in a higher level protocol and unbundled at the other end so the other PC doesn't know this happened. But again, this is what modems always did. They make a phone line look like a serial cable. Your PC never knew what a modem was. So they were already telling the computer lies. This is just a new, more egregious level. Now, I could rattle off about a dozen analogies for this, but I'll just pick one. This is no different, philosophically, from a voice over IP analog adapter, which takes the output from a telephone set and converts it into IP packets that can safely travel over the global internet while completely hiding this incredible transformation from the phone itself, which thinks it's still plugged into a 19th century telephone line. And given the incredible age of the RS-232 protocol, this isn't that far from the truth anyway. Honestly, it's a brilliant solution. It's called abstraction, baby. And it's the only thing I like about computers. It's the same reason VoIP works. Individual programs on your PC or machines on your network don't know or care that they're sharing your ethernet with 50 other things. They're all isolated from that. They send data, but they don't know where it's going or how it gets there. Your operating system bundles up their traffic in packets with a Mac and an IP address and a port, and that keeps it all separate from the other traffic on the wire. The program, or the phone, doesn't know that any of that's happening. It's all at a higher layer of abstraction. Computers are really good at lying to themselves. I love it. I'd speculate that DSVD is faster and maybe a little higher quality than ASVD because you're only playing one game instead of two. Modems are really good at making QAM signals. They're optimized to get the most out of a phone line with that format. Adding an analog component severely limits how much of the space can be dedicated to making that QAM signal as dense as it can possibly be. So you lose speed overall, and because you're now mixing voice with a complex data signal and then trying to strip it back out, you're gonna lose audio quality as well. Sending the voice inside the QAM means that bandwidth can be neatly, digitally divided up between the two purposes. It's clean, it's more modern, and it all around makes more sense. And sadly, from what I've read, it cost more, uh, probably because it needed a hardware audio compression codec, which was not a cheap thing in terms of silicon or licensing. So that's probably why when I could even find SVD modems on eBay, I saw more ASVD models than DSVD ones. In fact, uh, the technology even showed up in the HP OmniShare. Uh, I talked about this a couple of years ago. It's a sort of electronic fax machine. You could send a scan of a document to someone and then edit it on this tablet and the changes would appear in real time on their tablet. But there wouldn't have been much point in that if you couldn't discuss those changes while you were making them. So if we take a look at the front of the unit, it has a logo for AT&T Voice Span, which was the name of the ASVD technology before it got spun off through Paradigm. Now, of course, we don't know what protocols the OmniShare used, but anything involving imaging absolutely eats bandwidth. So if it was limited to 4,800 bits per second, it would have been pretty miserable to use, but it probably wasn't. That's actually kind of a lie I told you. The ASVD demo that I did earlier was completely legit if you were talking about the original ASVD. As it turns out, there were later enhancements. The command I used to set up our call earlier was ATSMS 2-4800-4800, and as you may have guessed, those numbers limit the modem to only 4800 bits per second because it restricts it to the original V.61 spec for ASVD, which could only go that fast. But this modem supports two newer modes called ML144 and ML288. So if I adjust this command to 14400 in both fields, and then we connect again, answer. All right, once again, uh, we are in voice mode, and let's go set up a Z modem transfer. And again, we can't trust this number, but 
it is running a lot faster, probably closer to 14 kilobits per second. Uh, and let's go start up Doom. All right, we're connected again, but this time, hey, look at that. It's running a lot better. In fact, it's actually running better than the DSVD modem was. These enhancements very clearly put ASVD back on top, at least among the modems that I have on hand. I still think that the multi-modem 56K would have outperformed it, but it's not here to defend itself, so we'll never know. In theory, the quality of this audio is also supposed to be a bit better, uh, but I'd probably need higher quality mics to prove that than whatever's built into the modem. Either way, we can be sure that this would have been more than adequate for pretty much any purpose, up to and including the most demanding video games. And that kind of makes the situation worse. Let's be honest. I can't say with certainty that these products failed. I don't have any proof one way or the other, but I'm pretty sure they did because I can't find much mention of them anywhere except breathless articles announcing their existence when they first came out. There aren't really any reviews or anything, as far as I can tell, and I've never met anyone who's ever heard of this technology. So I think I can infer safely that these didn't go anywhere, but we can also just guess that if we look at the facts. As we've just seen, there were a shitload of incompatible protocols. You wanna buy an SVD modem? Great. Which one should you get? Voice view? Audio span? What kind of audio span? V61, ML144, 288, some other proprietary extension? Should you get DSVD? Turns out those can use different codecs. That might be why these don't work together. Just like ASVD, whatever you get, the person you're talking to has to support all the same things. And that's getting into the weeds, because in the first place, you both have to at least have ASVD or DSVD in common, but every modem I've ever seen only supported one mode out of the three. Whoops! Did I say three? Multitech, who we've mentioned before, also intended to market their own incompatible thing called Multimodem PCS, another SVD technology that used something called the Multitech Supervisory Protocol, I don't know, some kind of rudimentary layer two packet format. I don't think it ever came out, but that makes this even worse. These are supposed to be standards, but as far as I've seen, to get this to work, you need two literally identical modems. My internal DSVD modems won't even talk to my external DSVD modems because they have incompatible implementations of the same thing. So you pick up the phone, it sends a ringing signal, the multi-tech has no idea what that is. It's, it's supposed to always be connected as soon as you dial up. So in practice, I think you just never would have called someone and found out that they happened to have the exact same modem as you. The probability was next to nothing. And if you were the one person to buy a multi-modem PCS before they gave up and decided the market was actually dying rather than getting bigger, you'd be completely screwed. And that was really likely because as all this was happening, DSL and cable were on the horizon. They didn't really exist in 94 when this crap started, but just a couple years later, the end of dial-up was tangible to anyone savvy enough to be researching this kind of specialized product. And besides that, cell phones were becoming consumer affordable and those got you a real phone line. There's the elephant in the room. None of these technologies solve the actual problem that I outlined at the beginning of this video. They let you talk and transfer data at the same time, but only when calling another modem user directly and only with that one person. If the bank wanted to call you, your line would still be busy. It may have been the case that in 94 or 95, more people were calling each other than dialing up to the internet. I'm guessing at that, but it seems pretty likely. That might've made this product somewhat more appealing at the time, but there was at best a narrow window where this made sense before the internet became the overwhelming use case for modems. And even then, you know, BBSs had big files. People spent long periods online, even in the late 80s. So what was the point in 94 or 95 in shelling out money for a specialized modem that still left your phone line tied up, as far as most people were concerned, when you could just spend that same money on a cell phone or a second line that would let you talk to anyone you wanted at any time? It makes a lot more sense, and I think that's what actually happened. So these products are kind of tragic. Like many things on my channel, they represent a ton of R&D and brilliant thinking poured into a problem that might have existed but probably wasn't anyone's first complaint. Their second or third maybe, but it's, it's sort of like if your apartment came with no stove and your landlord stopped by and gave you an air fryer. I mean, sure, yeah, you can make nice crisp fries, but that's like 5% of your food needs. What you wanted was a stove. None of these modem technologies would have kept your mom from yelling at you because your quake session was making her miss calls. So there was really no point. But hopefully you felt this video had a point. 
because it's over now. If you like this, consider subscribing. It helps when you make that number go up. Maybe even turn on notifications if you want to know when I upload new stuff, because I'm kind of off schedule these days. But if you really like this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing, because gosh golly, it costs a lot of money to buy modem after modem after modem after modem after modem, trying to find two that will kiss and be friends. Some of my projects take years to scrape together the right props, and I kind of have to just buy whatever looks like it might work on eBay and hope it wasn't a waste of money which it often is. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me on there. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you all so much. And to everyone else, thanks for watching. We're done.